Greetings all, Joseph Kursky here with you. In this video, let's examine how story maps and web GIS resources can help us help you teach about water, help your students not only learn about water, but care about water, and help them want to be a responsible citizen about water as change agents in their community. There are several reasons why I'm choosing the resources that I'm highlighting in this particular video. A, these are all compelling. They tell a great story. They're great and rich content for you to teach with. B, they have metadata so that you can accurately assess whether they're suitable for your particular subject matter, grade level, content area, etc. And C, they're tools that you can use, that your students can use to create their own content. More about that in a moment. This particular one I like because it's anchored to the sustainable development goals and also has a nice story to tell about, hey, what can we do about water quality in my community or your community? And how can we compare how different people are making a difference around the world using, again, story maps to tell the story. This video highlights this particular story map and the next story map is about two different rivers and why we need to be concerned about water law, precipitation, climate change, how we use our natural resources, including water and so much more. This particular one about the Colorado River reminds me with maps and data, wow, this is, this is a lot of information in a short amount of space, which maps have always been good at. Maps have always told a lot of information in a short amount of space, whether it was on wood blocks or paper or papyrus or silver, and in more modern times on copper plates, film, and now in our digital world. Always check the metadata usually found toward the end of the story map or the ArcGIS resource on the metadata page. So you can, again, understand who created the data, where did it cre get created, how often is it updated, can you trust the sources used, etc. So the Colorado River one reminds me of the Cadillac Desert book that was written in the 1980s, all about water law and the complex nature of water law that oftentimes stems back to the 19th century and even earlier in some parts of the world. This one on the Tennessee River uses, as you could see there, UAV or drone data. This particular one on changing waters helps you, it was written by a colleague of mine and hosted, as you can see here on the National Geographic site. It's, it uses time sequenced imagery that ESRI hosts in the ArcGIS cloud and has you step through the procedures to, and so can your students, to create a swipe map like this. So you can look at changes, the grim changes in these in the water level of, for example, the Aral Sea or Lake Chad, or you can use it in other place, places around the world. You can also look at agricultural expansion, deforestation, urbanization with the same kind of swipe tools with that same kind of imagery. This particular story map is an example. I like it because it shows what a in this case, a learning network is doing with water quality and getting citizens involved. And they're telling the story, again, using story maps. So again, another reason why I chose the set that I'm showing you here is because you can actually do the same thing. Let's say you've got a community or a school initiative to do something about litter or water or something else, invasive species in your community. This resource right here from my colleague, Dr. Dawn Wright, chief scientist here at ESRI, my organization, has a wealth, a true wealth of ocean related and water related story maps, apps, web maps, data resources, and stories. And so that alone will keep you busy for the rest of your lifetime, really, if you just tap into that. This particular one from my cartographer colleague, John Nelson here at ESRI, it not only teaches about the importance of marine trenches, and the, in particular the Marianas Trench, but uses a series of 2D and 3D maps. So again, the 3D platform is, uh, the 3D components are part of the ArcGIS platform that you can use, but also it's a great resource to teach about scale. So if I traveled through Midtown Manhattan, or if I placed buildings in the, Mar in the Marianas Trench or the Challenger Deep, or the Grand Canyon, how many Grand Canyons would fit in there. So it gives you a great resource to teach about scale. Oftentimes these concepts are hard to fathom. Uh, fathom, get it? Uh, a little water uh, pun there for you. How much would our lungs be compressed down to the size of a pea if we were able to truly breathe at the bottom of this trench? So it's just a fascinating, not only teaching about content, but also use of maps and, and infographics and other resources. And I'll, again, check the metadata pages and sections. This one shows that you can embed video, looping video, and also 3D scenes. In this particular case, it gets into 
the complex nature of the world that we live in. Should we dam rivers? Should we not dam rivers? Should we remove the dams or not remove the dams? There, there are conflicting and oftentimes contentious pressures on the landscape, and I think these maps, in this particular, the Elwa River in Washington State, USA, shows the story of why was the river dammed in the first place, and then why was the dam removed, and what the impacts are on the environment with the dam going up and with the dam coming down and the impact on fish habitat and so on. So by the use of these stories with 2D and 3D maps, you get a real sense for why this actually matters, not just to this watershed, but in other watersheds. This next resource, the Ecological Marine Units, here's the metadata page showing you that a variety of different science agencies, my own organization, ESRI, and other organizations contributed to many years, multiple years effort to create what I think is one of the top three web mapping resources of all time, and that is showing that the oceans aren't just a gray or blue expanse on a map, but they're actually rich with data, and they have vertical and horizontal components. So for example, with a 10 kilometer spacing, you've got all of these thousands and thousands of data points at your fingertips in all oceans of the world. So looking at not just the sea surface temperature, but the temperature down in the column, down to the bottom at that grid spacing. And it shows exactly how that data was derived. It also gives you an example of, hey, you can use these resources to teach elementary, primary school through university level. Primary school, Joseph, you say? Well, yes. Why is the west coast of the USA warmer to swim in or colder to swim in than the east coast of the United States. So touching on ocean currents. Why is the Arctic Ocean warmer or colder than the South Pacific? So get your elementary students, your primary students looking at that. For more advanced ages, sure, look at dissolved oxygen, salinity, and so on, and other chemical means uh, measures in the uh, oceans. But a vast wealth of information at your fingertips. This particular one I like also because it's closer to home for most of you viewing this video right now. So what about the Great Lakes? Why do we care about water in the Great Lakes? How important is the Great Lakes to bird migration, to fish habitat, to shipping, to commerce, to water resources for cities, etc.? So Buffalo and other cities on the Great Lakes, why does it matter? And what are people doing about water quality? This is an example, this Niagara Falls map is a good example, I think, of a map being used to tell a simple story in a tell a story in a simple way. It's a complex environment for sure, but telling it in a simple way. And so this is the advice I have for you all. Start here. Start with something like this for your students to create content. In other words, a couple of maps, a couple of images, a couple of pieces of text, and they're good to go. So start there. Start with something small but powerful and doable. This Living Atlas Indicators of the Planet this is, I would think, uh, a great resource. I've used this at the beginning of, for example, every Monday in class. Hey, let's look at what the status of planet Earth is. It's sort of a dashboard for the planet, if you will. So looking at sea ice, wildfires, climate, weather, natural hazards of various kinds. You get, with each one of these tiles, a set of infographics that you can interact with, graphs, maps, charts, and much more in 2D and 3D, in this case, sea ice. So again, come back to this every week in class period or assign your students, okay, choose a variable and then report to your classmates tomorrow about why this issue actually matters and the status of this particular variable and what we might be able to do about it with science, with geographic information systems, with people banding together across all disciplines, across all uh, countries of the world, what can we do about some of these situations? Because these issues on our planet do not stop at political, economic, uh, physical, or disciplinary boundaries. So again, a wealth of information. This particular dashboard was used was created with the experience builder. So again, all these tools that I'm showing you, you can actually use in two ways. You can teach content with it, but you can also have students create with these same tools, their own reports, maps, etc., that they can report out to you as their instructor, report to their classmates in an oral form or just to show their story maps or other web mapping applications. So these tools are not just viewable. You, you can't just view them in one way. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to view content that other people have created. No, you can actually create with these same tools that are all part of the ArcGIS platform that we're talking about today. So maps, infographics, dashboards, using tools like ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Insights, 
uh, ArcGIS Urban, Survey123, etc. This particular one here, if I was stranded on a desert island, I would probably pick this as my one of my top three apps to take with me. The world imagery way back. So it's satellite imagery in the visible spectrum spanning about seven years at the current time. You can use the swipe tool and look at things like urban sprawl in Las Vegas. You can look at deforestation, reforestation, uh, glacial retreat, coastal erosion, agricultural expansion, etc. So here in southwest Las Vegas, uh, there was a, a vacant lot in 2014 with some probably choya, rattlesnakes, and uh, sagebrush, and now there's an Ikea store. Why did that store locate there? Panning a little bit now to the east-northeast of Las Vegas and now looking at a different scale, but the same app Wow, changes in water level. Now, with all of these things, we have to ask what's where, why is it there, and why should we care? Why should we care if the water level decreases? Well, if certain cities all around the world, not just Las Vegas, depend on surface water like this and groundwater, and if that level is decreasing, we've got a big problem on our hands in terms of sustainable cities. So what are we going to do about it? So here, coastal erosion in England, you saw me searching on Eastbourne just now, and this apartment complex just to the south of the visitor center, which I actually have visited in the past, uh, has now been truncated because of coastal erosion. That whole west side of that apartment bl block, that row house, uh, has fallen into the sea. And so, again, why do we care about coastal erosion? Well, we do care about coastal erosion for a variety of way, uh, reasons, and that, that visitor center is going to be need, need to be moved in a couple years as well because you can see that the you can use the measure tool. The, it's only a few meters from the, the cliff edge. So here, agricultural expansion in Saudi Arabia, same kind of thing as we see in the central USA and in Kazakhstan and some other places around the world. We've got uh, major uh, agricultural center pivot irrigation uh, over the, just the past five years or so. So again, thinking about, okay, if we're mining the groundwater here, uh, what's it going to look like in 10, 20, or even five years from now? Or is this going to be able to be sustainable? So closer to home, look at your own neighborhood. Look at your own school campus, your university campus here. I'm looking at Uville University in New York in Buffalo. And I can see on the northeast side of campus, there is a new building uh, where in just a few years ago, there was a parking lot, as you can see here. I've switched it so the older imagery is on the left side and the newer is on the, on the right side, easy to do. And another thing about this Wayback imagery, you can take in the upper left, if you sign into ArcGIS Online, you can take these images into ArcGIS Online and you can overlay other data, land use, eco-regions, population change, etc. on top. And you can also bring it into ArcGIS Pro for further analysis. So you can use it outside of the app for more power. Wow, look at the changes just in the last few years. So again, powerful tools at your fingertips. Another Living Atlas app is the Water Balance app. I've got six variables at my fingertips. If I look at precipitation, for example, or evapotranspiration, transpiration. I'm going to look at precipitation. I'm going to click in the Amazon. It's not summer and winter. It's a wet season and a dry season. And I can pan across looking at data that's only a few months old and see when the wet and dry seasons are. And also look at the y-axis. In Libya, as you can see there, there's whole months of the year with no precipitation occurs. So what does that mean for ag? What does that mean for population? What about my own community? How is the trend of precipitation or any of these other variables been uh, trending over the last few years. What about if I look at southeast Texas? Well, a couple of these spikes are due to massive hurricanes dumping huge amounts of rain in a short amount of time. So you can see some spikes there from some significant typhoons slash hurricanes. So again, the water balance app, you've got six variables and almost real-time data at your fingertips. Last story maps I want to that I want to show you right now is this is an example of a water utility, in this case Raleigh, North Carolina, using story maps, ArcGIS Urban, ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS indoors to look at in interior assets to, as Andrew explains here in this particular story map, why do why do water utilities use these GIS tools for their science, for their communication, and for other um, management? Why do they use that? Because it's powerful, and it's easy to use, and they can meet their mission uh, using it. Now, how did I find all these resources? Well, there's a couple things I wanted to share here. First of all, Story Maps has a sort of a Story Maps Greatest Hits zone. It's a best of in these different galleries or albums, architecture, environment, um, arts and culture, etc. So I use the Story Maps gallery, recognizing, of course, that it's only really Story Maps Greatest Hits. There are over two million Story Maps now in existence as of mid 2021. So this is only the best of. But still, it's a great place to start looking for story maps. Another thing that I do is I, since this is all part of the ArcGIS gallery, or ArcGIS platform, if you will, I actually use ArcGIS.com to search for content as well. So here I'm in ArcGIS.com, and I'm going to search for content for the Dolores Huerta story map. That's my goal. I know it's in ArcGIS Online somewhere because someone's created it there using those tools. But if I just search generally, I'm going to get a whole lot of Dolores Huerta map layers in the maps. But if I 
narrow the search on story maps as you see me do here now the top choice is the story map and there's a couple reasons why I like this and I want to show you this one first of all it's a great use of technology so here it's using the express map function inside story maps to say okay she was born here she moved here this is the causes that she got involved with this is the difference and impact she made but also it's a great story about someone making a difference in the lives of people and for the planet so there's again these tools you've got an interactive map here you can click on different points lines and polygons to get a more complete story of in this case the life of Dolores Huerta so the point is here folks is that you've got a lot of powerful tools at your fingertips not just to teach existing content but you can also create them yourself and even better your students can create these to to tell stories about their own community about water quality about litter about social uh, justice about population change about natural hazards about energy about water uh, all the other relevant Relevant issues, uh, relevant issues of our 21st century world. So here's another resource that I use to find content. Here I'm looking in the Living Atlas of the World. So in the Living Atlas, you've got 8,500 or so data layers. I'm looking for the Esri Hydro layer, and I can open it right up in, in this case, the new map viewer. Or you can open it up in ArcGIS Pro as well or the classic map viewer, but I like the scalability of modern web-based GIS data sets. As you zoom in, you get more and more content. So at the small scale or the coarse scale, I see major rivers, the Amazon, the Yangtze, the Nile. And as I zoom in, I'm getting smaller and smaller tributaries with more and more detail. I also see this these dotted lines, which show me watersheds. Fascinating to be able to do this. So I'm seeing watershed boundaries and then, wow, look at this. At really fine detail, I'm seeing the wa watershed boundaries, for example, dividing Lake Erie's watershed from Lake Ontario's watershed just uh, outside of Buffalo, New York. And I can see that uh, it's 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 really close to several communities, and some rivers actually cross really close to the uh, watershed boundaries. Now, if I just added the satellite image, it's either either or. Either I see the satellite image as a base map, or I see the watershed boundaries and the hydro network. But if I add, here's a... Here's an ex a, sm a small extension that I hope is powerful and easy. If I add a layer and I look for imagery in ArcGIS Online, and I choose the Clarity layer, for example, it's one of my favorite ones, so Clarity, then it's a layer, not just a base map, and I have more power over a layer. So one of the things I can do with a layer, now I've got the World Imagery Clarity there, and now I can make it transparent with this transparency tool. Now I can see the watershed boundaries and the hydro the river network so I can compare dendritic to trellis drainage and all kinds of other things but here I can look at the distance for example between we using a satellite image for reference the distance between that river right there and the watershed boundary why does the river cross so close to the watershed boundary well it's it's all affected by glaciation in this case so I could anchor it to my glacial uh, studies unit fascinating so I can use the measure tool to find out that's only a mile away from the watershed boundary but lots of other layers inside the living atlas of the world and ArcGIS online so that's another way that I search and find data so that's where I found the s3 hydro reference overlay in the nat in the living atlas of the world you've got a rich set of metadata at your fingertips it shows who created it why was it created how often it was updated the scale it was created at, and so on some of the things you can do with it as well in some of the metadata I never metadata I didn't like. Uh, it's a little metadata pun there for you. How do I know if it's any good, the data that I find spatially? Well, my colleague Jill Clark and I wrote a book a couple years ago about public domain data, spatial data in particular. And so we maintain a blog because that story is not over, right? It's There's issues and new data sites and so on. So we have exercises. We have weekly blog posts about where do I find data? How do I know if it's any good? And how do I be critical of it? For example, here, George Mason University, simple Chinese fast food chain. Hmm, interesting. I thought it was a major research university. Oops, orientation matters. This was in a catalog. I know it gets hot in Texas, but real-time data feeds, sometimes they're in error and be critical of them. Really hot, really windy. Look at the precipitation rate. It's like Noah's flood. And even non-spatial data. Be critical of that too. This isn't even a real album. Look at the songs. Penny Lance is in my ear. I've never heard of that song. A Day in the Sky? I've never heard of that song either. It's someone's misspelled playlist, not really an album at all. So be critical of data, including, and may I say, especially map data. Anybody can create a map. 
Look at this post of mine recently about faked satellite imagery. Why would anybody do that? And why would you be critical of imagery? Isn't imagery the, the, the truth about the planet? No, you need to be critical of imagery as well. So that is the Spatial Reserves data book and blog. It's all about where to find data, how do I know if it's any good, and societal issues like location privacy. Look, the Living Atlas of the World in my top 10 most used geospatial data portals right there. And also I've got a, another list on how do I find Landsat imagery in multi-spectral bands spanning the last 45 years or so. So I've got another resource on that. I'll show you that right here. And here is my top 10, my top 12. I couldn't stop at 10 most useful Landsat image sites. So again, spatial reserves, what's, where do I find data? How do I know if it's any good? And societal issues like ethics and privacy and so on. Lots of uh, entries on location privacy and why should we care about it? I use this as an activity with my students, teaching with a big pixel image. How many people in a sample of 10 are on their cell phones? Why aren't their faces blurred out, etc. So again, I hope these resources are useful. These are a couple of ways that I actually found the resources that I highlighted earlier in this video. Thanks a lot and uh, go out there and map on.